Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin, urologist and sexual medicine specialist in the Washington, D.C. area. And this is Sex Matters. And we are coming to you live from the Mayo Clinic Urology Conference in Maui, Hawaii. Um, and I am with the world's leading experts talking about men's health, sexual health, and quality of life. I'm bringing in today Dr. Alan Mori, who is a dear friend and colleague uh, in the North Dallas area and one of the world's leading experts in reconstructive urology. He deals with all things urinary incontinence, penile curvature, and sexual health, and it is my absolute honor. And he said something at this conference that really put my chin on the floor, and I said, we got to talk about this on video. He said, the urethra is a sexual organ. It is androgen dependent and it is a sexual organ. And it's so important because this is true for all genders. So Dr. Mori, tell us a little bit more about why you made that comment and talk to us a little bit about incontinence in men that you deal with all the time. For many years, Rachel, I've worked at cancer centers where through the various treatments for prostate cancer, the men had suffered from urinary incontinence. And we had put a lot of artificial urinary sphincters in those patients. And there was one patient, he said, why do I keep having this erosion? Of course, the erosion is where the cuff compresses the tissue surrounding the urethra and that tissue gives way. And that's where there's a hole in the urethra. And I looked at him that day and he was pale and I thought, let me check his testosterone. And we started checking it on everybody who had this problem. And sure enough, the ones who had the cuff erosion, who had the atrophic tissue around the urethra, Many of them, most of them had a low testosterone. Some of times it was due to the cancer treatment, but other times it was just due to old age. And so we started thinking, uh, this is a causal relationship. And we tested, I had a fellow who was a pathologist, a board certified pathologist before becoming a urologist. And he obtained some specimens from the urethra, it did very sophisticated, elegant stains on that tissue. And it's just erectile tissue surrounding the urethra. That's why I say it's a sex organ. And in atrophy, I tell my patients, when you are a, a teenager, you know, you're, you're this, the tissue is thin, like on your pinky finger. As you get older, it becomes thicker. And then as you get, you know, even older and you're now having cancer treatment, everything else, all the meat is off the bone. All that tissue is gone and you can show your finger it's just around that size and there's nothing there protecting the urinary mucosa from the device and that's why it's important to you know maintain the optimal health of those tissues for them to remain dry because let's face it urinary incontinence is a horrible horrible quality of life these are my happiest patients when we fix it and when they go on vacation, they have a separate suitcase filled with diapers. They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. We actually found that when they become incontinent after the prostatectomy, they gain weight. And when you put in the device to treat it, they lose weight. And you can track it versus a penile implant. There's no change. So the uh, urinary incontinence patients really suffer. And um, we need to consider the medical optimization of those patients. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I just love how how um, analogous this is actually to our female patients. We know incontinence is devastating to our female patients as well. And there are there's a lot of hope. You know, I think people think as we get older, we just start to pee every time we cough, laugh and sneeze. Uh, the men are a little more bothered by it when they get proud. They don't know that it's sort of in, on the female side. It's sort of it's normal. It's not normal. There's so much we can do uh, to help these patients ranging from conservative treatment to surgical therapies for everybody. But again, important, the, 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 the connection between hormones and urethral health health is true on the female side as well. As you go through menopause, the urethral tissue thins out, gets dry, gets irritated, and it can cause worsening incontinence, pain with sex, and genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So it's really important. So how, um, for our primary care doctors listening, how do we talk about stress incontinence in men? How do we diagnose it? Well, it turns out it's so easy to diagnose. Just a quick history, find out how many pads a day they're leaking. You got to ask the question. And then you just have them stand up, look inside their underwear. You'll see what kind of pad it is. Is it just a shield or are they actually wearing pull-up diapers? And then what I have them do is a standing cough test. I just stand off to the side a little bit, hold a couple towels, have them cough four times. 
And we can tell, is it a full stream? Is it just a couple drops? Is it nothing, but they wear a pad? And so you sort of match it up and it just confirms literally in uh, an instant, it tells you how severe their problem is and it helps you direct them on to further treatment. Because many patients, they have treatment fatigue, they've already been through the system, they are really suffered and they don't know which way to go. They don't know what's available. And so on the female side, right, we have pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, we have uh, uh, certain, obviously, pads and devices that you can wear, pessaries. We have surgical options like bulking agents into the urethra, as well as urethral slings that can be quite helpful uh, for women. So there's a lot of hope out there on the female side. And from what I learned from you at this conference, there's a lot of hope as well on the male side. So talk us through treatment options from conservative to more surgical. There hasn't been much innovation in male incontinence treatment over the past few decades, but we're starting to see signs of new products that are appearing on the horizon. So I'm very optimistic in the next five or 10 years, we'll have more. But right now, it comes down to slings and artificial sphincters, which are devices with little pumps and hydraulics. And they're very good, but they've been around for 50 years and they have this other potential risk factor of the erosion of the tissue. But it's interesting. We don't have a pill that we can give the patient to tighten up those muscles. We can help them with overactive bladder, but maybe the hormonal influence is a way to optimize the health of the tissue so that these surgical treatments can really deliver the best outcome. And as I always say, and having treated so many of these patients, it's really a game of millimeters, how much coaptation you get. If you're off by the slightest amount, that's an unhappy patient. So it doesn't take much to make it potentially a lot better. Yeah. And um, again, I think there's so much hope for our patients, and this can really have an effect on sexual health. Uh, talk to us about your patients, you know, the, the benefits you see in sort of their quality of life and sexual health when you can stop leakage. Yeah. Well, I always take care of the waterworks first. Many of the men have both urinary problems and erectile problems. So we say, listen, nobody feels sexy when they're leaking urine all over their partner. So First, we take care of that. And then in the motivated younger patients, you know, we bring them back and then we talk to them potentially about a second operation. Yeah. And so uh, similarly, we know on the female side with urinary incontinence, it can really, really have a, a major impact on sexual health about how you show up, about how you talk to your partner. Um, and so uh, it, it is really important for our primary care docs to talk to patients about urinary incontinence and not just say, oh, well, you're getting older. There's nothing that you can do. There is actually no age with which there is nothing that we can do. And it's really important to refer to those urologists who have extra training in um, sort of incontinence and sexual health, because we do care about this. We do care about these quality of life measures. And there are there's a lot that we can do, ranging from conservative to more invasive, but patients really should have options. I heard during this meeting that urinary incontinence was the number one source of treatment regret among patients that had their prostate treated for cancer. So, so this is really big for our patients, and it has so many of these other impact you know, factors in terms of wellness, quality of life, and overall well-being. I always say that when patients, you know, when you're counseling patients for cancer surgeries or cancer treatments, radiation therapy, it, it's really hard for the they, patients have never had urinary incontinence. So they can't even picture what it might be like. So when you're telling them you could have a stroke, you could have a heart attack, you could have erectile dysfunction or urinary incontinence, they all sound similar, right? They're like, oh, well, that might happen to someone. It's very hard to truly counsel patients on these quality of life issues that they've never encountered before. Do you have often talked to patients before their, their cancer treatments? <laughs> Usually not. I'm, I'm more of a subspecialist referral practice, um, so it's more surgically based. Um, so, and, and we found that uh, it takes a long time for them to get into our office for treatment, and, and it's unbelievable. Many times it's five years in diapers until they find us. Well, hopefully videos like this will teach our docs and our patients that there is hope out there, that you don't need to wait years and years of suffering from incontinence. So how does somebody find a reconstructive a urologist or a sexual medicine urologist? Um, there's a couple good websites out there. There's fixincontinence.com. There's edcure.org. Uh, the device manufacturers have pretty good information out there available. And if you just type in uh, sexual health or uh, penile implant, for example, you can find people in your city.
And the SMSNA, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, has a great find a provider, which provides a lot of urologists who are both trained in sexual health as well as urinary incontinence because they both matter and our patients deeply care about these issues. So thank you so much, Dr. Mori, for coming. It's an absolute uh, honor to have you and hopefully y'all learned something.